Good morning, everyone. Um, we are just going to give it one more minute um, and we will get started right on the dot at 11 a.m. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's 11 a.m. and we want to be prompt. Um, so welcome to the first of five webinars um, that we will be offering here in the state of Colorado. My name is Melissa Tchaikovsky Houghton, and I am the Safe Routes to School consultant um, with the CDOT team. Um, and we are really excited to, be, to have you all here with us today. Um, as hopefully most of you on this webinar um, have participated in a survey where we asked all of our partners throughout the state what they would like to see as part of a webinar series. And so we got a variety of responses. And so for our webinar today, we are going to be starting essentially from the beginning. Um, so starting and growing a strong Safe Routes to School program. And um, partnering with us to deliver these webinars are, this, um, are two individuals from the Safe Routes Partnership, um, Michelle Lieberman and Corey Johnson. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them, um, and they will introduce themselves and then get us started in the webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, again, welcome to the first in the series of webinars. Today we're going to be talking about starting and growing a strong Safe Routes to School program. Uh, my name is Michelle Lieberman. I'm the... Uh, Consulting and Program Support Director here at the Safe Routes Partnership. I'm joined by my colleague, Corey Johnson. Corey, you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Nice to meet you all. So if you're not familiar with our organization, um, the mission of the Safe Routes Partnership is to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools in everyday life, improving the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. We're a national nonprofit organization. And our vision really is to create a um, safe, active, equitable, and healthy community for everyone, whether it be urban, suburban, and rural. So again, Corey and I will be presenting today's webinar. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, on, the go, on the GoToWebinar viewer, you'll see this on the left, you'll see the presentation. And on the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can raise your hand, ask questions, and select the audio, audio mode you'll use. Please note the control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. If you'd like to keep it open, you can click the view menu and uncheck auto hide control panel. There are two options for listening to us today. You can either use your telephone or your computer mic and speakers. Um, if you have sound problems with one selection, try the other option and we'll do our best to field any issues if you send us um, a message in the question box. So even though everyone's muted today, we really want to hear your input and questions. You can use the questions box to ask speakers questions for the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during that time. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available online. We'll provide the link in a follow-up email so you can refer back to it and share it with your colleagues if they weren't able to attend today. So our agenda today, we're going to talk about what is Safe Routes to School. Uh, we'll talk about the six E's of Safe Routes to School and how those are strategies for a comprehensive approach. Um, the bulk of our, our webinar today will be focusing on helping your program grow and develop. We'll also cover some ideas for initial activities and then wrap up with Q&A. So what is Safe Routes to School? Safe Routes to School is a simple way to increase kids' improve their health and help them be more focused when they arrive at school. It's a movement and a program that gives students, school staff, parents, and community advocates a chance to in safe and active travel for youth. A safe Routes to School has been implemented in the United States for over 15 years, 
and it's been through a rigorous evaluation that has identified Safe Routes to School as an effective strategy to improve health and safety outcomes for school-aged children. Um, Safe Routes to School can look different in every community, um, and its influence can vary widely from something like funding construction of a missing piece of sidewalk to something that can be as impactful as a wide-ranging walk-to-school program in schools across the entire community, complete with volunteers, encouragement events, incentives, and more. So champions in local communities around the country and also working at the state and national levels started Safe Routes to School because of a noticeable and concerning decline in the number of kids walking and biking to school. In 1969, uh, nearly half of kids um, in the U.S. walked or biked to school. And, just, and today, just 13% of students do. So this was a dramatic drop. And one that was also at the same time, um, we saw a, a number of problems sort of related over, over overlapping, um, related, starting to happen. Um, today, about a third of our children are overweight or obese, triple the rate of a generation ago. Family car trips make up 14, up to 14% of morning congestion. And motor vehicle injuries are one of the largest sources of fatalities uh, for children, whether they be passengers in the car or on foot or on bike. Um, and higher negative impacts of this traffic in, is happening in low-income communities where there's been less investment in safe infrastructure and also higher injury rates. So the great news is, you know, there have been many studies that show safe routes to school works. Um, studies have shown that students have, have, who are participating in education and encouragement programs um, lead to an increase in about 35 to 45% in walking and biking to school. Safety has improved with Safe Routes to School infrastructure improvements, and Safe Routes to School is providing the opportunity for daily physical activity that's contributing to healthier kids who arrive at school ready to learn. The benefits of Safe Routes to School extend out into the community, creating more community connectedness, improving air quality by reducing car trips, improving safety not only for the students, um, but also the school neighbors and other community members who are walking and biking along those same routes, improve safety from crime, um, safe routes to school is reducing transportation costs for individual families, but also for school districts who are busing, um, and again, healthier students who are better ready to learn through the program. So how does Safe Routes to School work? At the local level, um, Safe Routes to School programs are organized by cities, counties, schools, school districts, or community organizations. And these programs can serve one school or many schools throughout the community. We see a lot of different configurations. Um, at the state level, level in Colorado, um, the Colorado Safe Routes to School program is administered by the Department of Transportation, or CDOT. And the program provides resources to help support local programs. And it's guided by a five-year strategic plan. Um, the Safe Routes to School program in Colorado is a federal aid funded program whose goal is to enable and encourage safe active transportation of kids while they walk and bike to school. Um, the program awards two types of grants, infrastructure and non-infrastructure, to eligible applicants that meet um, requirements and deadlines. The infrastructure grants are used for engineering projects that can involve um, construction, constructing new sidewalks or facilities. Um, and then non-infrastructure grants are used for educating students, parents, and communities about safe, active uh, travel to and from school. Um, like Melissa said in the beginning, um, she's the consultant who manages the program, and she functions as a member of the CDOT Bicycle and Pedestrian and Scenic Byways section. Um, and her responsibilities include soliciting the grant applications, managing grantees, um, managing data, and providing oversight um, for the infrastructure projects that are managed by the CDOT region in which the construction project is located. The program also provides, besides funding, a number of other resources. Um, these include promotional materials for Walk to School Day and Bike to School Day that are up on the Colorado Safe Routes to School program website, um, as well as different training and curricula, lesson plans, crossing guard training. There's a bicycle uh, rodeo, train the trainer. Um, these are all available on the Colorado Safe Routes to School webpage. And then as a reminder, uh, the next uh, call for projects um, for Safe Routes to School is happening in Colorado in August of this year. So I'm going to turn it over to Corey to talk about the six E's of Safe Routes to School. Thanks, Michelle. 
So I'm going to share a bit about the, um, the six E's of, the, of starting a comprehensive Safe Routes to School program. And Michelle, can I advance the slides? Or can you advance the slides? There we go. You should have control now. So, um, so a comprehensive um, Safe Routes to School initiatives have been shown to be more effective in increasing physical activity and reducing injuries. And so the six routes, um, the six E's of Safe Routes to School kind of summarize the key components of a comprehensive integrated approach to Safe Routes to School. We also have a bunch of information on our website um, about the six E's going more in depth about each one and giving you a few ideas for what you can do in your school in your community. But I'm gonna um, just do like a short overview today of the of the six E's um, of a comprehensive Safe Routes to School um, program. So the six E's are education, engineering, evaluation, encouragement enforcement and equity. Um, and again, as I mentioned, studies have shown that a comprehensive approach to Safe Routes to School is more effective. So including all of the all of the six E's into your um, into your Safe Routes to School um, initiatives. And, you know, obviously they don't necessarily all have to be balanced. There might be some situations where there needs to be more education over engineering or a situation might need to be more encouragement um, over over enforcement. But the idea is for all of the six E's to kind of work together to create a really comprehensive, um, comprehensive program. Um, for example, a, we've, a study had shown that more than 800 schools in four states um, found that safe routes to school interventions resulted in an 18% increase in walking and biking when there is an engineering improvement, um, like a new crosswalk or a bike lane, um, a 31% a 31 increase um, over five years of educational and encouragement programming, and then a 43% increase when engineering was combined with the education and encouragement programming. So again, it's really strength in numbers um, and, and an all hands on deck approach with the six E's. So to get started on the first one, we have um, education. So education is all about providing students and the community with the skills to walk and bicycle safely and educating them on the benefits of walking and, bike, and, bi and biking um, and teaching about a broad range of transportation choices. And as we know, transportation is changing all the time now. So, you know, even thinking about um, scooters or students who might travel on, um, on buses, whether it's, um, you know, a regular yellow school bus or, or a city bus, um, just making sure that everybody knows about all the different transportation options um, that, that are available. And education can happen in many different ways, from modeling safe behaviors to explicit um, safety instruction, like a bike rodeo, Older students might also like to take a hand, more hands-on role in an educational piece by creating safety campaigns or events for their peers. I've worked with a lot of middle school and high school students who run their own safety campaigns around distracted walking and, and safe driving. Um, the students in this in the in the photo that's displayed there on a bicycle um, on a uh, traffic garden course, like a bike skills course. Um, so they're, you know, doing more hands-on, um, you know, bicycle, bicycle safety training, but it basically can kind of look like um, whatever makes sense in, in your community and your setting. So the next E is um, engineering, and engineering is all about creating physical improvements to streets and neighborhoods that make walking and bicycling safer, more comfortable, and more convenient. And um, again, students can also play a role in, in creating a safe physical environment by participating in walk audits. Um, engineering is also an opportunity for you to connect with your local DOT and bike ped organizers um, if they if you want to schedule a walk audit together and um, and and kind of work together to create those infrastructure improvements that make the area around the school a lot safer. Um, this can also help provide um, important data that can help you advocate for change. So you know, noticing if there is a lack of um, crosswalks or, or speed bumps. Um, a, a walk audit and some more engineering approaches can be a great way to collect that data and say, you know, these are the changes that we need to see to make our um, the area around our school safer. 
So next up is encouragement. And encouragement is all about generating enthusiasm um, if to, to increase walking and biking um, for, for students. And you can do this through events, activities, programs like Walk and Bike to School Day, bike rodeos, walking and biking campaigns. And I'll share some more, um, some more concrete ideas a bit later. Um, encouragement is all about, you know, kind of getting people excited and inspired, um, celebrating the small successes. Um, is also a really big important is also a really big part of the encouragement piece, especially if you're thinking about um, you know people asking people to change behaviors or try something new. Um, keeping up that encouragement is, is super helpful in having a solid program. Um, next, we have, we have enforcement, which is about deterring uh, unsafe traffic behaviors and encouraging safe habits by people walking, biking, and driving in school neighborhoods and along school routes. Also, enforcement does not necessarily mean the police. Um, it can include school staff, crossing guards, community members, and peers. And it can also be about holding each other accountable and working in collaboration with, with, with your community. Next up is evaluation. So obviously we, all do, we do all these great things. We want to make sure that we know what's working and what's not working so we can adapt, adapt and get better for next time. Um, so evaluation is really about assessing which approaches are more or less successful and ensuring that programs and initiatives are supported um, are supporting equitable outcomes and identifying unintended consequences or opportunities to improve the effectiveness of each approach. And lastly, um, but certainly not least, we have equity, which is about ensuring that safe routes to school initiatives are benefiting all demographic groups with particular attention to ensuring safe, healthy, and fair outcomes for low-income students, students of color, students of all genders, students with disabilities, and others. Um, equity is also about creating a sense of belonging and a sense of community. So it's about opening up spaces for us to connect with each other, um, get to know each other, and, and really build a, a, a movement together. Um, so it's really important to make sure that your Safe Routes to School approach includes everyone and pays close attention to the voices that are usually underrepresented or, or unheard. Um, so thinking about, you know, who's, who's at the table and who's not at the table, who are the parents and families we see all the time, and, and who are we not seeing. Um, and again, it's also important to remember that each school situation is different and has different structures. So for example, there might be some schools that have really great PTA support and other schools or communities where there is no PTA. So thinking about, you know, knowing the community that you're working in and thinking about um, you know how can we best support this community and not assuming that all communities are the same um, or have the same resources or, or structures is also an important part um, of an equitable approach to safe routes to school and i'm going to pass back over to michelle and she'll share a bit about how how you can develop your program and um, help it grow and flourish great thank you corey um, so we're going to spend some time talking about how to operationalize your program and how to guide your how to guide your program on a trajectory of growth and strengthening. We really want to create strong programs. Um, so we're going to talk about the stages that programs go to get there, um, and then the components that you will want to think about to really create and build that strong program. So today we're going to think about uh, creating a strong program in four stages using the analogy of growing a tree. Um, we're going to talk about starting your program seedling and moving towards having a, more, a mature program or tree. So the first stage, um, starting your seedling. We have some tips on giving your program a good start, and you're likely uh, actually already doing some of these things in your community. Um, so we wanted to reinforce uh, some of those beginning um, uh, fundamental things. Um, first, it's always great to have initial goals in mind. Some programs feel like they uh, should start by addressing safety concerns first before they can encourage more students and families to walk or bike. And so the, addressing these safety concerns becomes their goal. Some programs feel like they have less safety concerns, are really ready to uh, focus on shifting families from driving to walking and biking off the bat. And so that may become your initial goal. So along with having those initial goals um, is making initial plans. Think about things like who's going to take the lead on activities, um, who's going to be a supporter of different activities or steps. Um, you may have thoughts on a budget if you know your program already has a budget or if there are resources um, being provided by the city or school. Um, if so, what do you want to do with them? And, so, and then also what other resources uh, do you need to start working on those initial goals? Um, it's great to kick off education and encouragement activities. 
right away. Um, even if they're small, these can create relationships and enthusiasm at one school or more than one school to get families on board and kids moving. Um, also at the stage, you're probably beginning to develop relationships with key partners. Um, and it's really great to outreach to the city, the school district, school board, um, PTA, community groups, and get their ideas and also build support. And then early on, many communities are making opportunistic um, infrastructure improvements. These can be low cost, um, easy fixes made by um, the public works department or engineering department um, or added into existing projects. And so those engineering opportunities can come along as you are developing um, your program. Um, some programs honestly get stuck at the stage. Um, so just, I think our key message is always keep moving. Um, it may seem like there's a lot of things to work out, but keep moving come along. So the next stage, growing supportive branches. Uh, once you've got your things kind of up and running a little bit, really thinking about developing supportive structures. You'll want to develop more of your program framework and be cultivating the supports that are going to make your, pro your program strong and long lasting. Um, this includes engaging more community members, recruiting more uh, volunteers, more families to participate, uh, more organizations and um, other agencies to find out what the needs are and also um, how your state throughout the schools can address them. This could include doing surveys, um, doing observations around the school, or just talking to more people. This is a great time to create a task force, which we'll talk about more shortly. Um, this task force is a way of bringing together um, and organizing different stakeholders and agencies to work together and focus on immediate activities as well as your long-term uh, goals and needs. Um, at this stage of creating those supportive structures, um, you'll probably be thinking about creating a more formal action plan to assist with prioritizing activities and having a guide for your local program that, to make sure you're addressing local needs and matching your resources. Um, and these action plans don't have to be very, you know, elaborate or in depth, but really just setting out some uh, key steps and responsibilities and matching those to, you know, your local needs and resources again. Um, some of the programs and communities start out at the stage. Oftentimes, if you have a grant funded program where the initial steps from the last stage were part of developing your grant application, you might actually start your program here with developing supportive structures. The next stage, becoming a healthy tree, is about institutionalizing your program. So at this stage, your program is up and running and well established. This may honestly be a few years down the road if you're just getting started out. Um, but here's the point where we really want to um, put emphasis on strengthening and sustaining the program. Uh, we want to continue sustaining and expanding activities. And it's really crucial to work towards continuity. So you might um, be thinking about how to scale up from, say, a single school to multiple schools, um, or also just trying to maintain um, and grow the efforts um, at an initial, your initial school. Um, we want to think about staffing. And lasting Safe Routes to School programs we find require permanent staffing for continuity, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, so you want to identify ways to permanently have staff assigned to Safe Routes to School. Um, securing long and short-term funding is obviously important. We'll talk more about that later too. And at this point, um, you're probably looking at infrastructure planning. You know, more carefully um, and thoroughly cataloging needs, um, prioritizing with the agency that is um, going to be doing infrastructure improvements, identifying funding sources, um, all the things to make um, infrastructure changes along the route to school. Then we also want to look at policy change, um, looking at addressing any negative policies um, and also adopting good uh, school district and city policies um, to really help support and institutionalize your Safe Routes to School program. So again, the stage can be really far down the road if you're just starting out, um, and it might be the stage that seems like an end goal, but good to think about, you know, even in your, you're starting out to, to think about what's going to be happening down the road. And our final stage um, is becoming a comprehensive program. Often, safe routes school programs become really strong and institutionalized, but it can reach a small percent of the students within the area that they're serving. There's also you know, great potential to do more than that, and so and many programs have done this. Um, so that 
final stage, uh, we talk about becoming a comprehensive program. And we see components um, at the end of, as, you know, kind of the end result of a lot of hard work. Um, but having comprehensive programming that reaches every school, different age groups, um, kids of all demographic groups, and also including kids with disabilities. Um, we'd like to see a comprehensive equity approach. Um, as Corey said, it's really important to think about equity throughout all of your work. Um, so having equity integrated into the programming and also reflected within um, the program's you know, funding and evaluation metrics. Um, at a comprehensive program level, uh, we're looking at larger infrastructure changes. You know, these can take a longer period of time. Um, and then also we want to be evaluating and continuously improving. Of course, we want to evaluate along the way to make sure we're doing the best that we can. And, having, and aren't having unintended consequences. Um, but it's also a reminder that even the most mature comprehensive program can continue to evaluate and always uh, be working to um, continuously improve. So as I talked about these stages, I've mentioned a number of things that we think are really essential components of a Safe Routes to School program. Um, these are the things that we really see uh, present in strong and sustainable Safe Routes to School programs across the country. Um, so you might not have all these things in place in the start, but we want uh, we think that they're things that you should be thinking about and ultimately incorporate into your program. So I'm going to talk about these in more detail. Um, they are a Safe Routes to School coordinator or staffing, a Safe Routes to School task force. We're going to have a sidebar on program structure and where it lives. Um, we'll talk about funding and then Safe Routes to School policies. So what is a Safe Routes to School uh, coordinator do. Um, having a coordinator is really essential to a strong per program. Um, this is the point person who takes the lead so nothing falls through the cracks. It can be a single person or a person supported by additional staff and volunteers. Um, so a Safe Route School coordinator is managing the overall program, leading the task force when there's a task force, being that coordinator, recruiting and training volunteers and others to implement uh, the education and encouragement activities, um, identifying and prioritizing concerns. Again, um, really looking at strategically expanding the program, identifying funding opportunities, and leading evaluation. Um, so many communities start out with a volunteer coordinator. Um, and in terms of resources and needs early on, this may totally be appropriate. As your program grows and beco becomes more complex, um, communities often find that it's also great to have um, paid staff. And so there's some pros and cons to each. So I'll go through the benefits. Um, you know, the benefits of having volunteer coordinators and staffing, obviously cost-wise, it's more affordable. Um, and it can be easier to get going because you're not having necessarily to deal with the logistics and bureaucracy of who employs and who manages the staff. Um, and someone's personal passion can really create their commitment and investment um, that can bring upon enormous change. Um, some benefits of paid coordinators, uh, we see oftentimes that paid coordinators stay on in the position longer. Most of the times, uh, volunteers are, are parents or family members of students, and when those students age out of the school, those coordinators age out. So having a uh, paid coordinator versus a volunteer coordinator can ensure some longevity. Um, we also see that, you know, it can take a lot of time and energy to staff a Safe Routes to School program. And so we see that volunteers average, you know, four to 10 hours a month versus a paid coordinator, you know, if however the funding is available, can be spending a lot more time um, working on Safe Routes to School. And then with a paid coordinator, um, you know, they often go through a hiring process and they're more likely to have um, the necessary you know, skills and background in place to really be effective um, and to you know, stay in a position and grow it over time. So the second component I'm going to talk about is a Safe Routes to School Task Force. Um, and the goal of a task force is to coordinate all the essential stakeholders to get work done. Um, task forces can meet monthly, they can meet quarterly, um, you know, some meet more frequently or less frequently as work happens. Um, and task forces usually happen, we see at a school district or city level, but you can also have layers with a task force at a, at a higher level, um, but also a local school committee or working group um, that's doing something specifically at a specific school. 
And really this depends on what works best for your community and the resources available. So we've included here a graphic with some of the key partners on the right um, to think about including. Of course, there are other local partners um, that, that are probably you know, great in your community. Um, some of the key folks that we see are school district administration, um, school principals, Obviously, if you have your Safe Routes of School coordinator or um, lead, um, city staff, whether that be from public works or planning, uh, your local bicycle and pedestrian organizations are great as well, as well as public health. So the core responsibilities of a task force are to communicate and inform stakeholders, get input from different perspectives, make um, joint decisions, and really look at what are the broader community goals um, and needs. Um, obviously, you know, being able to divide up the work amongst folks um, is important and, and great to coordinate through the task force. Um, a responsibility of the task force can be to ensure that equity is built in through all the procedures and processes, um, and really looking at determining needs for new policies or policy change at the district or city level. So I'm going to have a little bit of sidebar about program structure because one of the things that we get questions about um, a lot is where your program should live and what should the structure be. Um, so it's something that obviously a lot of folks are thinking about. Um, programs of the country, around the country really vary and we see all sorts of configurations and no one is necessarily better than another configuration. Um, so we see programs that live within a local or regional transportation agency, um, within a planning department, even a police department, um, sometimes with a nonprofit community organization. We've seen programs live um, within a school district. Um, sometimes they live within a, a specific PTA um, structure, within a cal county health department, everything under the sun we've seen. Um, and like I said, no one is better than the other. Um, and so how do you decide where to locate your program? Oftentimes it comes down to who is willing or you know, who has the capacity to do this. So this may depend on who has funding or a staff person who can be devoted to Safe Routes to School. Um, and it's one of the things that we um, like to share though is while one structure isn't necessarily better than another, it is likely going to influence the emphasis of your Safe Routes to School work. So for example, if a Safe Routes to School program is housed within um, a school district. There's oftentimes a lot of emphasis on the encouragement and education aspects of programming. Uh, whether, or on the flip side, if a Safe Routes to School program is housed within a city planning or public works department, um, the emphasis could really be more on making infrastructure improvements and relying on other partners to take on the education and encouragement, um, and those might get less emphasis or less funding. Structures also um, likely change over time. We see programs as they grow in funding or evolve with different partners. Um, you know, programs can be affected by the formality and growth and different parts of the work can be taken on by different um, entities. And so that's why it's really important to have that task force and those structures in place to bring everyone back together. So next essential component of Safe Routes to School and Safe Routes to School programming is obviously funding. Uh, we need funding for staff salaries, for infrastructure improvements, for the incentives for programs um, and expenses for activities. So some of the common funding sources, um, volunteer time and in-kind uh, resources are um, a big one starting out, honestly. Um, but as we look at uh, moving from short term to long term, uh, there's a lot of creative ways to uh, think about um, funding your program. Um, so eventually, um, you'll probably be wanting to think about, are there health funds available? Um, some of the common ones are you know, state or federal CDC grants, as well as local healthcare foundation grants um, and local community fen benefits funding. Um, some programs are funded through foundation grants. Business sponsorships can help bring in support. Um, it's great if a school district or a city is willing to provide money out of their general fund uh, to support, support Safe Routes to School. And then one of the largest um, funding supports for Safe Routes to School we see is transportation funds. So in Colorado, the Safe Routes to School grants 
um, as well as any uh, local transportation measures. And the last uh, aspect or component that we see for a strong um, Safe Routes to School program is Safe Routes to School policies. Um, this is a little bit of a teaser because on our next webinar, we will focus specifically on Safe Routes to School policies at the um, municipal policies as well as district policies. Um, but policy change is really essential to long-term change and um, moving, from, moving more students and families from driving to walking and biking and doing that safely. Um, policies can come in different forms, but in general, it's a written law, rule, or practice that is binding and is applied broadly. These can include school board policies, safe routes of school resolutions, um, a city's complete streets policy, or a city's comprehensive plan. They help really create um, and institutionalize safe routes of school, create consistency, and ensure long-term implementation. So for more detail and some worksheets that go along with these essential components and the stages, we have a building blocks guide that's available on our website, saferoutspartnership.org. Um, that has you know, walks you through all of this as well as has um, some really great worksheets and resources to follow along. So I'm going to turn it back to Corey to talk about ideas for initial activities for your Safe Routes to School program. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I guess before we get started, I, we know that we're giving you all a lot of information today. So if you have any um, questions or comments, feel free to pop them in the in the question box, and we will have some time at the end um, for for a brief a brief Q and A. Um, so I'm going to share a few ideas for um, for getting your Safe Routes to School program up and running. So a few, um, yeah, just a few starter activities. Um, And so with, um, you know, with, with starting up a program, the idea is that, um, you know, initial activities are all about buy-in and, um, you know, meaning that it's okay to start small and that celebrating the small successes are really important, um, as I mentioned before. So it's all about building momentum and, and, and getting started um, and thinking about activities that can inform and evolve into, into larger programs. So the first idea, um, and I guess before I get started, some of these activities are, um, are from um, some work that I've been doing in Washington, DC, where I'm based, um, running a few different Safe Routes to School initiatives connected to Vision Zero. Um, so some of the activities that I'm mentioning are from um, are things that I've done um, in communities in DC, and we also have a few um, examples from other communities around the country. Um, so one activity that I really like is doing a butcher paper graffiti wall, and um, this is something that's kind of a, a fun, creative way to, uh, you know, to build community and also um, learn about where you're working. Um, so butcher paper graffiti walls, they can build awareness around a specific um, cause or campaign, you can brainstorm ideas, you can identify barriers to walking, biking, and scooting. Um, and so I've used these from everything from, you know, outreach events to back to school nights um, to just creating a poster for a walk to school day or bike to school day. Um, you know, sometimes I might bring out a roll of paper and put out some markers and ask a question to the community. Um, and a question could be something like, you know, what would make you feel safer traveling to school? Um, or what's your favorite way of traveling to school? Um, so as opposed to going out and doing a survey, for example, I might bring out some butcher paper and markers and do a little bit of creative, creative crowdsourcing. Um, and this is also a fun activity because it's great for volunteers or students. It's literally just a piece of paper and, and markers, um, but it can go a long way and give you some great information um, about the community in which you're working and also gives the school a great keepsake um, if you're doing if you're doing a, a Safe Routes to School event. And as you can see um, in my next example about walk to school day, um, there's a group of students there who created a, a poster out of butcher paper for their uh, for the walk to school day event. Um, so one great encouragement project is offering a walk to school day event at your school and a walk to school day is a great way to introduce students and families that traditionally do not walk um, 
to, to school and provides a fun event where kids and families can get out and explore the value of walking. Um, we also know that there are some, some routes to school that are not walkable for various reasons. It might be too far away or too unsafe. Um, so some people organize remote drop-off locations where students will then get driven to a certain spot and then walk to school from, you know, let's say a block or two away from, from the school building. So again, thinking about how everybody can participate and, and, be, and be involved. And um, the walk to school day is um, is uh, observed every every October. Um, we also have a lot of resources on our website about um, planning a walk to school day. Um, but gen generally, they are um, a fun, um, safe, and and exciting way to encourage more more walking um, in your community. Along with Walk to School Day, there's also Bike to School Day, which is very similar, except it's all about biking. Um, walk, a Bike to School Day is observed every year in May. So coming up this year, I believe that Bike to School Day is May 6th. Um, and again, it's just another way to, um, to encourage biking, biking in your school community, giving people tips on, uh, on safe biking behaviors. Um, some Bike to School Day events that I've seen have involved different bike rodeos, um, bike helmet giveaways. Last year, I worked with one school that did a little bike license plate activity so students could make a little license plate, almost like a car license plate but for their for their bike, um, and also bike giveaways. Um, and we've also partnered with our local Safe, Route, um, Safe Kids Coalition for both Bike to School Day and, walk, and walk, to, walk to School Day. So if there's a Safe Kids Coalition in your area, um, they'd be a great uh, partner to reach out to about organizing a Walk to School Day event or a Bike to School Day event. So next up is um, a walking school bus. And a walking school bus is a fun and safe way to get kids um, physically active as they're traveling to and from school with adult supervision. So a typical program usually has a bus, quote unquote, of students that walk along a set route with one or more adults leading it. Um, and so the adults pick up students and students and children along the way at designated stops and walk them to school. So it, you know, it sounds like it 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 works the way that it sounds. So it's like their actual stops, the way that there would be stops on a regular, on a regular bus. Um, and the process is reversed in the afternoon on on our on the way home. Um, and so, you know, sometimes walking school buses are led by adults, either volunteers or staff. Um, working in, as a team helps takes takes the burden off of individual parents because it is definitely a time commitment. Um, we've also found that walk, walking school buses help reduce tardiness, um, where you know students feel you know like they know what time they're supposed to be at their stop, and they're excited to join the to join the bus, and their uh, you know parents feel comfortable and families feel comfortable because it's led with adult supervision. Um, and then along the walking school bus route, you can also incorporate various safety education. Um, uh, activities, so showing kids how to cross the, how to safely cross the street, or listen to a crossing guard, or uh, pay attention to a stop sign or traffic light, all of that can be included in a walking school bus program. And this is one example out of Prior Creek, um, Oklahoma, where um, the community has organized Walking Wednesdays, where high school students lead a walking school bus. Um, and the students, um, they work, work with three elementary schools. Um, and these are high school students, and they were trained by um, local police staff, city staff, the, the school district, and Cherokee Nation to lead the walking school buses. Um, so again, it's a way of involving older students in Safe Routes to School programming, kind of giving them a leadership role, and making this something that's really all about the, all about the community and all about working in collaboration. So next idea is a bike rodeo, which is another fun way to help students build um, build bike skills in a safe and controlled and controlled environment. Um, you know, some schools have bike fleets or um, that either live you know on school site or that are rotated around different schools. Um, but you know, getting getting kids on bikes and doing a little bike rodeo um, you know skills course is a great way to um, get students comfortable with riding um, and and the rules of the road. Um, and, you know, those can be led by you. Um, I've seen them being led by teachers and, and school staff um, or trained, you know, trained cyclists. Um, your local bike groups or bike advocates might have people who are used to, um, you know, doing some bicycle training. Um, and bike rodeos are fun for the whole family. Um, I've seen them done with the littlest ones. I think the students in the photo are pre-K um, all the way up to, up to older students. Um, and next we have a safety awareness demonstration. So um, 
This is actually an event that I worked on here in Washington, D.C. There was a community member who did not have kids at the school, um, but she was concerned about a lack of a, of a safe drop off, a drop off zone in front of a school in her community. And so she decided to help, um, you know, to organize a safety awareness demonstration in partnership with the school, um, law enforcement, other community members. And then the school had a student safety patrol um, group. So we all kind of came together and worked to lead the safety awareness demonstration um, to let DDOT or our Department of Transportation know that um, this was an unsafe um, school drop-off area and that we wanted to make some, some changes to improve that. So in this situation, we worked with a local um, art organization to help, help the students create flags, uh, like bright colored flags to wave at their, at their demonstration. So we did some work prior to the event. We came out and brought some flags and markers and stickers and paint and the students were selected. Um, the student safety patrols went and made, um, and made their little flags for the safety demonstration. And then while we were doing this, they also shared with us some of their concerns around not being able to cross the street safely or almost being hit by cars. So um, it was both a creative activity and also a chance for us to learn a bit more about what students and school um, and school staff and families were, were concerned with. We also invited um, the, our police officers out to come and and create um, and create the flags with the students. Um, in the community where I work, there's a lot of there are a lot of different uh, feelings around working with police. Um, some people are fine with it. Some people don't want police involved either because they don't feel unsafe or they just had negative experiences of working with law enforcement. Um, in this case, we got the go ahead to bring the, the bring the uh, police officers in, and they were great. And they also got a chance to talk with students and learn a bit more about what they, as police officers, could do to help. Help improve improve safety on the street. And these are a few of the flags that the students created that they then took out um, the following week and kind of waved um, as as during school arrival. Um, so as students were being dropped off and as people were you know driving across the street, they encouraged people to slow down, to stop. Um, and out of this event, we actually got, um, uh, it wasn't a speed camera, but the speed limit was lowered in front of the school. And they're working on putting an official crosswalk in front of the building and also creating a more, um, a safer designated drop off zone. So again, that was like a fun, creative way um, to, um, you know, do an educational and encouragement activity that also led to some concrete changes. Um, so those are just a few different ideas for uh, activities to start your Safe Routes to School program. We have a lot of um, additional resources available on our website. Um, we have resources on how to start a walking school bus at your school, how to get a bike train rolling on your school. A bike train is very similar to walking school bus, but it's with a bike instead. Um, we also have resources on Safe Routes to School messaging, so creating a communications toolkit for schools and school districts. Um, we also have, have a facilitator's guide for engaging middle school youth. Um, so, you know, again, working with older students is always a challenge. I'm just trying to engage um, engage older students is a challenge. So we also have a few, a few tips for you on working with older people in Safe Routes to School. Um, sometimes there's a perception that Safe Routes to School is just for elementary school, but it's really not. Um, older students commute to school too, so um, involving them in the process is, is really important. Um, we also have a few resources on um, planning a walk audit at your school. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, that engineering piece um, can be can be a great approach to a comprehensive Safe Routes to School programming a program. So thinking about how to um, involve students in that walk audit process, um, we have some of the uh, resources available for that. And um, we also have um, a few resources for how to create pop-up um, Safe Routes to School projects. So, you know, just like small demonstrations um, and, and a few different ideas for, um, for, for pop-up events that you could do at your school that, um, you know, don't necessarily take a lot of um, resources or, or time that, that could have some really great long-term um, impacts for improving safety around your, around your school community. And as we mentioned at the start of the webinar, that um, all of our webinars are available on our website for, uh, for downloads. So you just go to saferoutespartnership.org and click on the resource tab um, and then click on webinars. You'll see all of our webinars on the left-hand side of the page. All of our past webinars are there for you to, uh, for you to enjoy and then learn from. So we highly encourage you to visit our page to check out our webinars and our other, um, our other resources that we have offered on our website. 
Um, we also have an email discussion network where you can connect with other Safe Routes to School practitioners. Um, so obviously it's great to talk to us, but we also want you all to talk to each other and share your ideas and expertise, um, especially people who've been, you know, kind of at this for a long time. Um, you know, you're the ones who are, you know, doing this day in and day out. So we want to make sure that you all have a chance to, um, to connect and, and share and get inspired by, by new ideas and support each other. Um, and also we're always happy to like connect you all if you have other, um, if you have other, you know, questions or, you know, have specific needs, um, we work with communities across the country that are doing amazing work um, and we'd be happy to kind of, you know, support you in, in making those connections and, and getting some new, uh, some new ideas. And so we wanted to leave plenty of time, um, so that was a lot of information and a lot of us talking, plenty of time for questions and answers. If you have any questions about anything that we've uh, we've talked about, if you have questions about uh, anything that needs to be clarified, anything we did not cover, um, this is your chance to to ask us questions. So as I mentioned before, please feel free to drop some questions in the question box um, or in the question box if you have them, and we'll spend a few time um, doing a doing a Q and A. Sorry, this is Michelle. I, this is yeah. not a question that came through the question box yet, but it's a question that um, I hear a lot from different communities. Could you talk a little bit um, in those activity ideas that you shared, which ones um, required funding and which ones were you able to organize um, and pull off without funding or very minimal funding? Sure. Yeah. So the project that I worked on was funded through the DC Department of Transportation. So um, so there there was funding attached to it. Um, you know, something like the butcher paper graffiti wall, for example, I just went to the dollar store and got a pack of markers and a pack of butcher paper. I love the dollar store. So for um, you know, for for activities uh like like that that are uh you know that are um, that involve creative materials. Um, I just go to the dollar store and see what I can find. Um, also for our walk to school day events. Um, so as I mentioned, we partnered with our safe local safe kids coalition for the walk to school day. So, um, you know, they had funding to put on that and we came and worked with them as community partners. So a lot of these events were, um, you know, like working in collaboration with people since funding is always tough. So we just kind of saw, you know, who had resources for what and pulled those together um, with the safety demonstration that we did. Um, we didn't have any funding for that and we just came together as community partners to put to put that on um we had worked with a local arts organization who they were happy um, or they were generous enough to donate um the flags and the art supplies and the art supplies for that um so i would say you know funding is always an issue we're always thinking about ways to um you know <laughs> make our make our programs work and be successful with very little resources um but um, a, a lot can be done can be done with a little if we kind of all work together and um, and are a bit creative um, in, in in what we're trying to do. So that, that was a combination of of, of both um, in the examples that I've been working on. And I see another question in the question box. Um, suggestions for incorporating bilingual programming, specifically regarding specifically regarding equity and identifying what is most beneficial um, for each neighborhood. So yeah, so incorporating bilingual programming. Um, you know, we do, uh, as I said, we do a lot of work across the country. So there are a lot of safe routes to school programs that do um, that do have uh, bilingual programs, making sure that all of their, you know, posters, flyers, and outreach materials are in, you know, multiple languages. Um, you know, having community events or community meetings where there are, um, you know, where there are interpreters that are provided, um, that's really helpful. And again, working in partnership has also been great for that. So working with community members who, you know, speak the languages um, that, are, that are represented in the student body, working with other community partners has been really helpful, you know, in, in making sure that, um, that, that there's a, a equitable a multilingual approach to safe routes to school programs. And Michelle, I don't know if you have any other specific um, 
examples. Um, we also have a number of resources on our website, um, and they're in a special uh, section that um, are in Spanish. Um, so we do have the walking school bus um, toolkit available in Spanish. So if you're working with community members who speak Spanish, they can um, they have you know access to those materials as well. Um, we also have some of the communications and talking points um, that Corey mentioned in that communications toolkit available in Spanish. I believe we have some of the, um, information available in maybe a couple other languages um, too as well. And there's a number of programs like Corey mentioned around the country uh, who are working in multilingual you know, communities and have translated um, their materials into various languages. Um, and so you know, those are always great to draw from as well. So we're not having to reinvent the wheel. Yep. We also have another, another question about how to change the philosophy of cities from safe zones to safe routes to school. Um, this is an example from Denver that has one block around schools with slightly slightly reduced speed limits, and we really need um, we really need routes to become to to become safe. Um, you know, that's something that I've been working on a lot here in in DC, kind of that shift from you know school school zone to to safe routes to schools. So I've been working closely with our um, with our city's um, safe routes to school coordinator um, and inviting them to some of these outreach um, and, and engagement um, events um, to, you know, to kind of talk about the, the realities of what it's like traveling to school um, in a city. Um, block audits have been a great way for uh, for us to kind of do that and get more get more buy-in uh, from the from the city and state level. Um, so we've organized walk audits with students and community members and then we invite somebody from the Department of Transportation, you know, out to kind of walk around and see, you know, and see what it actually looks like um, on a street. Um, so that's been one way that's been, uh, you know, that's that's had some success um in DC. Michelle, I don't know if you, any, if you have any other examples from um, communities that you've worked in around um, switching from yeah. safe zones to safe routes to school. And in addition to the walk audits, which are a wonderful tool, especially if you you have those decision makers um, involved in hearing directly from the students from the community, um, looking at uh, collision data and if you're able to um, parse out collision data, also you know showing um, those that have involved youth walking and biking um, to show that the collisions are happening you know not just right within those um, that school that immediate like one block radius um, but along you know the routes and if you're able to map those out uh, in addition to where uh, people are living those can be uh, really powerful graphics great um, and I think we'll have time for one more so how to overcome marked community anxiety because of a publicized assault on a young child in a community while walking to school um, you know, so again, we know that this work, um, you know, it's it's tough, and there are situations that that arise that definitely not only impact, um, you know, a, a route to school, but also just community safety, um, safety in general. Um, I think that you know, one way could just be kind of like following the lead um, on the community. So if there are community meetings around, um, or, you know, around what happened, or ways for you to kind of be a supportive um, ally in a community that's dealing with a situation like this, that would be. Um, you know that would be that would be helpful um and i think also just you know like talking with people um you know kind of engaging parents and uh and and engaging community members um and you know just kind of um you know getting to know um you know like what their what their anxieties are and and also asking how you can be a support um i think that sometimes we feel like we have to kind of go in and have all the answers and sometimes it's just asking you know like what what would how can i how can i help you um or how can i help this community um you know feel a bit better and and heal um and oftentimes the community members have the best you know have the best ideas or, or ways for um or ways for you know, doing that. Um, I can also, I know we're running short on time, so I can also do a bit more thinking and get back to you if I have some concrete strategies, but I think that, um, you know, being a being a listening ear um, and asking the community how you can support is always a great way to kind of start, um, you know, building those bridges and and um, and beginning to heal um, for what I'm sure was a really tough situation. Um, Okay, so before you wrap up for the day, and thanks for all your questions, um, those are great. Any questions?
questions that we didn't get to, again, we're happy to follow up with you uh, with you offline. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us after this. We're happy to, um, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so following this webinar, we will ask you to take a brief survey to let us know what worked for this webinar, what didn't work, um, other, other ideas that you would like for us to include in future webinars. And also if you're somebody who um, would like to present on a future webinar or share some of your expertise or information, we are always looking for, uh, for panelists and speakers. Um, so please feel free um, to, to, to join us in, um, in presenting at a future webinar. We also have a few reminders before we finish up for the day. So National Bike to School Day is coming up on Wednesday, May 6th. As I mentioned, we have plenty of resources on our website about organizing a, a bike to school day event. Um, and again, we're always available to help, um, you know, if you have um, ideas or need suggestions for planning one, um, we're, we're happy to help happy to help provide some resources for that as well. Um, you can also sign up for the Colorado Safe Routes to School newsletter. Um, you can email Wendy McPhillin um, to, to get signed up um, for the newsletter. Um, there's also an upcoming Safe Routes to School grant cycle. Um, I believe it will be, it's anticipated to open in August. And you can reach out to Melissa to set up a one-on-one -on -one call to discuss your project idea. Um, so getting some more funding for your project. And, um, and Melissa's contact information is below. And as Michelle mentioned, we have an upcoming webinar, our second one of the series on Safe Routes to School Policy. That will be at um, April 21st, um, same time, 11 a.m. And here's the contact information for uh, Michelle and um, my contact information. Again, feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any questions, um, anything that you would like to see addressed at a future webinar. Um, we are definitely resources who are here to help you and support you as you, um, as you grow and develop your great programs. So Michelle, do you have anything else to add before we close it out for today? Or Melissa? Or Wendy? Just one reminder um, from Melissa. Um, we should mention that all K-8 schools will automatically be receiving the materials from CDOT for Bike to School Day, those promotional materials. And let's see, Melissa, did you have anything else? <laughs> okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, just to expand a little bit for the Bike to School Day materials, in the past some of you um, may be familiar, we've asked you to request, uh, make a request for each of your schools um, for those materials. And this time around, we decided to just mail to every um, K through eight a school. Um, so any K through five, or um, if there's a K through eight, whatever the um, configuration may be. So every school by the end of this month will receive two posters, um, each side, one side is English, one side is Spanish, and then you'll also receive um, approximately 200 stickers um, that you can use on that day um, to hand out to your participants. And then just as already was mentioned, we do have additional resources on our website, um, such as backpack stuffers that teachers can print off um, and hand out to their students, um, as well as some other um, downloadable materials that you can use for your event in May. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. So we are a little bit minute, minute past time. Um, so we'll wrap up for the day. Thank you so much. Um, and we will hopefully see you all in the next webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.